My name is Jay Shamba. I'm the co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, here at GW. Um, we at IEP are very pleased to be hosting this event on the April IMF World Economic Outlook. Uh, we at IAP have been partnering with the IMF over, I think now the last six years or so, at this point, helping roll out different major publications. And of course, for the IMF, the, the WIO really is uh, the major flagship, um, drawing a lot of attention around the world and in policy circles. So we're, we're very happy to be here. Obviously, the IMF does its own rollout of, of these publications. The idea of these meetings is to provide an opportunity for the authors of the chapters to give a more detailed presentation and especially to have a robust conversation with outside discussants. For those of you who don't know us, IAP is located at the Elliott School at GW and is a cross-school interdisciplinary research center at GW. IAP aims to serve as a catalyst for high-quality, nonpartisan, multidisciplinary research on policy issues surrounding economic globalization, a mandate we interpret fairly broadly, so it includes research on uh, policy in the area of trade, international finance, development, poverty studies, climate change, and economic policy more broadly. Um, we have been very busy lately at IAP with ongoing series on India's economy, China's economy, inequality, rethinking capitalism, and multidimensional poverty. So please visit our website where you can see either past events or upcoming events, of which we have uh, a number still. Um, including next month, we'll be hosting um, an event with the IMF discussing the Global Financial Stability Report. I want to thank Kyle Renner, who you just met for a moment, uh, for doing all the organization here, and especially thank our student staff, who uh, we couldn't do anything without the very large number of students who help us do both the research side, but also pull off these events. Um, today, we have three um, different chapter presentations, followed in each case by a great discussant. Um, first up is Mahar Nabar, head of the World Economic Studies Division at the IMF, who will be presenting the chapter Global Prospects and Policies. And our discussant for this is Karen Dynan, who is at the Kennedy School as well as uh, Peterson. So I'll turn it over now to Mahar. Thanks, Jay, and uh, thank you to uh, the Elliott School for hosting us. It's always a pleasure to be here for this event. Uh, we always have great discussions here. Um, we have three short presentations today on the WIO. I'll start with the first chapter, which is uh, an overview of, of the, the outlook uh, for the global economy, the risks and the policy priorities. Um, and just to go over some of the main themes, I've put together a short slide presentation, which I'd like to share with you now. Um, uh, just by way of context, we released this report two weeks ago in, um, uh, it, at the spring meetings, and as you may have seen, we, we uh, upgraded our global growth forecast for this year and next year, which may be a bit surprising given all of the bad news on the pandemic, uh, but essentially there were three factors, even with the worsening pandemic, we, we saw three factors uh, supporting an upgrade to the global growth outlook. First is the, the rollout of vaccines, particularly in some advanced economies where the vaccine rollout has uh, provided some hope that, that we will be able to turn the corner on this pandemic uh, in the second half of this year. The second factor behind the upgrade was additional policy support in a few key large economies, uh, particularly the United States. Um, and finally, we continue to be surprised by the data on adaptation to subdued mobility especially in, in the manufacturing sector where outcomes have, have surprised us on the out, upside. And overall that uh, has led to an upgrade to the global growth forecast. I should mention though that there's still very high uncertainty about what lies ahead. Um, and, and all of this that, that, that we're presenting here today is conditional on what we know now, but things are changing very rapidly on the ground, um, especially with regard to the pandemic. And, and we could see a very different uh, story from the one I'm telling right now. But as of now, the baseline projection looking out into the medium term uh, suggests that we will see smaller persistent damage to the economy uh, in this, this, from coming out of this crisis than we did after the global financial crisis. But that depends on um, two things. One, making sure that we're able to beat back this pandemic globally by the end of 2022. And secondly, that this health and economic crisis does not morph into a more systemic uh, financial distress episode. 
Uh, if those two conditions hold, the persistent damage is likely to be smaller than what we saw after the GFC. But there is a reversal of patterns with the EMDEs, the emerging market and developing economies, expected to suffer larger medium term losses this time than advanced economies. Whereas after the GFC, it was the advanced economies that suffered bigger medium term losses. A key theme that we, uh, that we highlighted in the WIO was that we are seeing divergent recovery speeds, and this is tied to access to vaccines and therapies, to the size and effectiveness of policy support, and also to the structural characteristics of economies, uh, with, uh, for example, tourism dependent economies uh, hit the hardest by this crisis and also expected to, to experience the slowest recoveries coming out of it. We're seeing divergences not just across countries, but also within countries with uneven impacts across demographic groups, youth, uh, women, uh, lower educational attainment workers hit relatively harder compared to their uh, comparative groups. In terms of the policy messages, uh, we called for a tailored policy approach, tailored to the stage of the pandemic and to the strength of the recovery. Um, and to focus in the, in the here and now on beating back the, the pandemic, prioritizing healthcare spending, while also providing well-targeted support to cushion income losses. But then as the pandemic uh, situation improves, as labor market conditions normalize, to shift the focus away from retention and lifelines to reallocation. And finally, to also address uh, the many challenges that we inherited going into this crisis and the legacies that this crisis is gonna leave behind in terms of boosting, making sure that we boost productivity growth and, and lift productive capacity in the economy uh, to ensure that these gains are shared equitably um, and to address the, the uh, ever pressing challenge of climate change. Just very quickly, before I go into the, the numbers, as I mentioned, even with this worsening pandemic, we continue to be surprised by the economic macroeconomic data. And what we saw at the end of last year was that for most countries for which we track quarterly data, uh, GDP outturns in the fourth quarter of 2020 surprise on the upside relative to what we had forecast. Uh, this is seen in the, in the yellow bars here on the screen. And this comes uh, after upside surprises that we saw even in the third quarter. So the second half of last year was, was considerably stronger than what we'd expected uh, going into, into that period. And that leaves us with a better starting position for 2021 um, and is one of the factors behind this upgrade. The high frequency indicators continue to suggest adaptation to subdued mobility, uh, mostly in the manufacturing sector where um, the, the outturns have been fairly strong. Industrial production is now, well, is now above pre-pandemic levels, as the chart on the left shows you, uh, but services continue to be subdued. The chart on the right shows you that the, the manufacturing recovery, the industrial production recovery was accompanied by a very strong rebound in, in merchandise trade volumes and less so in, in the services trade. Initially, the, the rebound in merchandise trade was mostly concentrated in uh, consumer goods, durables imports in the advanced economies and capital goods imports in the emerging market economies. But the category of goods over which this recovery has registered has gradually widened over the course of uh, the last six months. Accompanying these developments have been strong improvements in commodity prices since the middle of last year. Uh, this wasn't just in, in oil, uh, which was much in the news a year ago when oil prices had, had plummeted. Uh, but the recovery has been more broad-based. Metals prices have also seen very strong recoveries tied in part to the, the improved outcomes in China in the second half of last year. We've also seen increases in food prices, although some of that reflects supply constraints and uh, food scarcity problems in some parts of the world. Financial conditions have been broadly supportive, um, and, and that is, of course, a, a plus point in the recovery. Even though we've seen some volatility in financial markets in the last three months, in general, things still are far more accommodative and supportive than they were um, back in February and March of a year ago, um, and that bodes well for the recovery going forward. But there's still a long way to go. Uh, if you look at where we are in terms of the strength of the cyclical recoveries, we still see considerable slack. Output gaps are negative, both in advanced economies and in emerging market and developing economies, especially in the latter group, uh, well into 2020, project well into 2022, and some, in some cases, even into 2023. And the labor market uh, still has a long way to go in terms of regaining <laughs> employment levels and labor force participation rates of uh, the pre-pandemic period. Uh, there was a catastrophic hit to employment last year. Some of that has, has, has uh, 
we still have a long way to go in terms of uh, regaining those levels. And even if you look past the headline uh, employment numbers and you look at um, other indicators such as involuntary part-time employment or the hours work, uh, that, that tells us that there's still a lot of slack in the labor market um, and, and, and there's room for, for policy support to lift outcome, improve outcomes uh, along that dimension. Just to round out the, the, uh, the other aspects of the recovery, uh, one topic that's been much in the news, particularly in the United States uh, lately, is uh, the question over inflation prospects. So far, we're seeing inflation remains muted, inflation pressures remain muted, both in advanced economies and in most emerging market and developing economies, although there have been some cases now where inflation has ticked up. Uh, we should expect to see inflation especially headline inflation um, increasing in the next few months because there's a mechanical base effect we saw with the very low commodity prices last year. There's, there's a, there's, the base effect from that is going to show up in, in, um, in higher headline inflation over the next few months. But our sense is that this is likely to be transitory and that given the large slack and, and the excess uh, labor supply that still needs to be absorbed into, uh, into, the work, into, into employment, there's still some way to go before inflation pressures start picking up. And our baseline is for inflation to remain quite muted, uh, even in the United States, which uh, has been very much the focus of this debate uh, in recent times. As I mentioned, still high uncertainty around the forecast um, and this divergent recovery speeds that, that, uh, I meant, uh, that I talked about has a lot to do with the, the uh, differential pace of vaccine procurement the chart on the left shows you the, the highly inequitous uh, procurement of vaccines with the advanced economies uh, securing, in many cases, ex surplus doses, excess doses, whereas low-income developing countries, many of them relying almost entirely on the COVAX collective procurement vehicle, are still looking to secure adequate doses to cover their populations. The other factor behind the differential recovery speeds is the, uh, the difference in the extent of policy support. The chart on the right shows you that advanced economies last year delivered substantial fiscal policy support. EMs uh, did as well, but to a, to a lesser extent, reflecting the more limited policy space that they were operating with. And this year too, advanced economies are expected to provide uh, additional support uh, EMs, on the other hand, we're expecting as crisis-related expenditures unwind and as revenues improved with the, with the strengthening recovery, we expect headline uh, fiscal balances to, to uh, return to, to be less accommodative than last year. But in general, these differences in vaccine procurement and in policy support are the main factors behind the, the projected differences in recovery speeds. So I have two slides here on our forecast. As, uh, as I mentioned, we've upgraded our global growth forecast uh, from, from our previous projections in January to 6% for 2021. A lot of this has to do with the group of economies that you see here on this slide, the advanced economy group, and in particular, the United States, where we had a substantial upgrade to the 2021 forecast, reflecting sizable additional fiscal support that, that, that has been legislated. But also elsewhere, improvements to uh, the growth projections reflecting in part additional policy support, but mostly uh, improved adaptation, uh, where, as I mentioned earlier, activity indicators continue to surprise us relative to what we had expected, even in the face of, of uh, renewed upticks and continued subdued mobility and renewed restrictions. Turning to the, the emerging market and developing economy group, we, we've also upgraded our forecast for this group to 6.7%. Uh, uh, largely reflecting the, the upgrades to, to China and India. China uh, is a, it follows from the upgrade to the global um, outlook for, especially for its trading partners, the United States, um, and stronger net exports expected out of China this year. India activity, India, India surprised us on the upside last, uh, towards the end of last year and early, early this year. As, as you know, the news coming out of India with the pandemic has is, is been truly horrific in, in recent weeks. And there are severe downside risks to this projection. Uh, but even when you look at that 12.5% number for India, uh, it's important to, to, to take to look at that in the context of the negative 8% contraction. Uh, the two-year two forecast uh, calls for a very small expansion relative to 2019. 
substantial risks around this, this projection, uh, largely related to the part of the pandemic, uh, but also uh, related to financial conditions. Uh, we've seen financial conditions tighten a bit this year, largely related to shifting expectations about the, the outlook for monetary policy in the United States. As long as these, these increases in interest rates are accompanied by improved uh, news on growth prospects, they may not pose difficulties for emerging markets. But if we see sudden increases, a steep gradient in these interest rates, because markets suddenly shift expectations for the outlook for Fed monetary policy, for example, and this isn't accompanied by, by good news on the growth front or improved uh, news on the growth front, that could pose some difficulties to vulnerable emerging markets that have borrowed heavily in foreign currency. I wanna to also touch very briefly upon um, uh, the medium term outlook and here to just draw attention to, to the, what I think would be the key legacy of this crisis. And that is the, the, uh, the setback to human capital accumulation due to the, the, the school closures that we had last year. Again, very large uh, impact, especially on low income developing countries, which, were, which found it more difficult to substitute into virtual methods of instruction, remote instruction. Um, but also substantial hits to, to instructional time in, in emerging markets and, on, and in advanced economies. And of course, this will translate into, as we know from past evidence, um, subdued earnings prospects at the individual level going forward, unless remedial measures are put in place. Um, and at the aggregate level, subdued productivity growth because of the, human, the, the, the slow accumulation of human capital. Looking out to the medium term, we're projecting substantial losses across uh, various regions that we track, especially the, the EM Asia group, excluding China, uh, but also across the other emerging market groups, less so for the advanced economy group. Um, and for the United States, actually the United States is now projected to do better than what we'd expected prior to the pandemic, largely because of the substantial policy support that's been put in place uh, and is, is, is likely to lift growth above our pre-pandemic baseline. Let me, let me just close very uh, with, with two, two slides on our policy messages. This is necessarily broad brush because we cover about 190 economies here uh, in the report. But we're essentially at the national level, as I mentioned, calling for a tailored approach to, to target it to the stage of the pandemic and to the, state, the strength of the, the economic recovery. Um, and this, this translates into various phases the, where places where the pandemic is accelerating, clearly the focus should be on prioritizing healthcare um, and vaccines and therapies. Uh, as, the, as the pandemic is beaten back and as labor market conditions normalize to shift the focus away from retention and lifelines to, to reallocation, to put in place remedial measures to address the setback to human capital, capital accumulation. Finally, looking ahead, uh, once the pandemic is beaten back, to, to address the legacies that, that are likely to be left behind by, uh, by this crisis on top of the ones, the challenges that we'd inherited going into it, including uh, anemic productivity growth, uh, debt overhangs, um, and, and um, the worsening situation on, on, on climate and the impact that's having on global, trend, global temperatures. All of this will require a very strong multilateral component uh, on the health front to ensure equitable access to vaccines, but also on the international liquidity front to ensure that, that financially constrained economies have unimpeded access to international liquidity to, to en enable them to continue making these vital uh, spending outlays to ensure that their economies uh, get back on the path of durable recovery. So let me stop there and, uh, and pass it over to Kara. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, that was that was great. Um, an impressively quick run through a very dense and big chapter. So um, I'm now going to turn it over to Karen Dynan for some comments. Uh, sure. Uh, I want to first say thank you to the IIEP for giving me the opportunity to comment on chapter one of the IMF's April 2021 WIO. And I want to especially thank the IMF leadership and staff for producing what is such a valuable resource for policymakers and for anyone who is trying to understand what is going on in the global economy. The report, um, not just chapter one, all three chapters, just has an impressive amount of useful information and high quality analysis. Um, since I only have a few minutes, I'm not going to use slides. Uh, what I am going to do is talk you through some reflections on what I think is the most important theme of the chapter, which is uncertainty about future prospects. 
And I know this theme is very much on the minds of the IMS staff as well, since it's highlighted in the first sentence of chapter one, and there is a substantial section on the uncertainties following the presentation of the baseline outlook. Um, so my list of key uncertainties is not that different from the list that Mahar offered in his presentation. Um, and although I think the most policy relevant uncertainties involve risks to the downside, I was, I was really glad to see him mention that there are risks to the upside, such as productivity being stronger than expected, um, which I, I, I agree with him about that, um, as that speaks to the degree of balance in the IMF forecast. So anyway, what I want to do is I want to build on what Mahar said and elaborate on the three sources of downside risk that I am most concerned about right now. So the first is vaccine inequality across countries. As the report makes clear, we have a distressing situation right now with the IMF forecasting that effective vaccines will be unavailable for most of the population in emerging markets and developing economies in 2021. So obviously these economies need their populations vaccinated before they can return to anything like a normal economy. But I think in a, an important additional point that needs to be emphasized is the risk of negative spillovers to the rest of the world. And these spillovers could occur through, through trade, they could occur through the financial system if ongoing disease further strains countries' public finances, and most importantly, they could occur if vaccine resistant virus variants arise in places where the pandemic is uncontrolled and then spread to the rest of the world. The second source of downside risk that I wanna talk about is possibility of overheating and inflation, mainly in the United States, but possibly in some of the other large economies where large amounts of pent up demand may be released as people are vaccinated. And here I think the report does a great job of characterizing the potential for significant fallout if financial conditions tighten sharply because central banks are forced basically by this overheating to withdraw monetary policy support sooner than expected. So we can see declines in risky asset prices, losses at some types of financial institutions, higher risk premiums, rollover risk for some emerging market and lower income countries, uh, which would then uh, you know, in turn have um, important economic fallout. Um, so I should, be, I should be clear on this one, that I agree with the IMF's baseline projection that overheating is not the most likely outcome. At the same time, I would have liked to have seen more discussion of the reasons why some people are somewhat worried about this issue. So for example, all indications are that aggregate demand fell short of aggregate supply in 2020. That's an argument made in the report and I agree, but we need to bear in mind that things are changing rapidly in economies like the United States. So we know we're gonna be surging, facing a surge of demand in coming months. Um, and we, we just don't know how long it will take uh, for the supply side to, um, to rise as well. We don't know how long it will take for businesses to open up again. There are uncertainties about labor supply, given that people are still concerned about the virus, that women are still facing heightened childcare responsibilities and other factors. Um, and of course, you know, slack, what I was just talking about is only one of the key determinants of inflation. The other key determinant, inflation expectations, is something for which we have a limited understanding in normal times, and I think uh, even less understanding now. And finally, I should say, we're facing some very big measurement challenges when it comes to detecting a sustained pickup in underlying inflation. Um, and, and that's gonna be a challenge for central bankers, even if like the Fed, they have said they're gonna wait until labor markets are fully normalized. I think they're just gonna have trouble deciding that we have seen a sustained increase in inflation. The third source of downside risk that I wanna flag is the potential for recoveries 
within countries um, that continue to be uneven across the income distribution. So this is the so-called K-shaped recovery problem. Um, we know that losses to date have been concentrated among lower wage workers. We think that in rich countries, much of the hardship associated with this job loss uh, for this part of the population has been mitigated by government support, although we could use better direct data on that question. Um, and the good news is that there are signs that um, demand for these lower wage workers is going to pick up sharply as firms in the service sector open up again. Um, nonetheless, it's important to recognize that um, jobs needed to be, need to be created or recreated for millions and millions of people. And the disruptions endured by many businesses, especially some of those in the services sector, are going to be hard to overcome, which will slow the hiring of lower wage workers in coming months. Um, some jobs will never be recreated because of automation. And indeed, we have data showing that many businesses accelerated automation during the pandemic. And other jobs will never be recreated because productivity is likely to rise within industries as weaker businesses exit and more efficient businesses take up the slack. I should say it's to the IMF's credit that they have a whole chapter of the WIO focused on helping the labor market adjust. Um, but in the context of chapter one, I wanna point out that there are macro risks associated with an ongoing K-shaped recovery. We have a, a large and growing literature in economics now that demonstrates how weak finances inhibit individual mobility in ways that also hurt the productive capacity of the economy as a whole. And a key lesson from the Great Recession period is that leaving people behind damages the social fabric and erodes trust in institutions and expertise in ways that can seriously obstruct constructive economic thinking. Um, so anyway, those are the three uncertainties I'm most worried about. To, to wrap up, I want to say that one of the reasons I wanted to talk about the large amount of uncertainty is because it has important ways, uh, sorry, it has important implications for how we make policy. Um, I myself have spent most of my career at institutions that were, at the time, focused mostly on making policy around a baseline forecast that captured the most likely outcome. But in periods of high uncertainty like the one we're facing now, um, policymakers they really have to think differently because we want policies that will do well or as well as we can under a variety of potential outcomes. And I think in some cases, this is more straightforward than others. So for example, if we go big on addressing vaccine inequality and we're wrong that it was a risk, the costs are pretty small to that. Um, likely when it comes to overheating, the central bank's current wait and see approach may well be optimal, even if the baseline turns out to be wrong. Um, but I think in other cases, such as for the K-shaped recovery, uh, it's more complicated since, as Chapter 3 points out, um, a country will need to switch from retention policies to reallocation policies at some point, and we don't know the right timing for that to occur. So that's a case where countries should probably be thinking about a package of policies that could be robust to different outcomes and um, policies that are configured with dials instead of switches so they could be fine tuned to economic conditions. So um, thank you, uh, that's all I have to say and I look forward to our discussion. Great, thank you so much, uh, Karen. And uh, first I would just like to apologize to everyone for the Zoom bombing that was happening earlier and especially to Mahar, I hope that wasn't too distracting. I do think we've got it under control. I, I hesitate to point people to the chat to put questions in because there was nonsense being put in the chat earlier, but if you do have questions, you can put it in the chat now and I'll bring them forward. Um, in the meantime, I do wanna just um, maybe ask Mahar to respond a little bit to some of what Karen was asking. And in the interest of time, maybe I'll point you to one section, which is kind of the question of why aren't you worried about inflation? And whereas Karen was saying, you know, she thought it might've been helpful to kind of at least raise some of the concerns people have and at least explain why you don't think they're, they're there. And I guess one thing that struck me was you have a very small positive output gap for the US relative to what some people are worried about, right? Like you, you've only got, I think, 1% in 22 and 23. 
And if is that part of the issue, you just don't think it's going to go much past potential? Or is it, I guess the other thing is every other country but Canada was negative, right, in your output gap, even in a few years. And to what extent is it more a global game that you just think low aggregate demand around the world maybe is going to hold down inflation in the, the few countries that are pushing ahead? Because I think that global piece is something that isn't in the U.S. debate much, the idea that U.S. aggregate demand can spill over, over its borders. And you seem like one of the best place people to address that. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Karen, uh, for the comments uh, and and Jay for the for the additional questions there on that. You know, we would be the first to acknowledge that there's huge uncertainty about the output gaps, I and mean, we 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 show our best guess estimate of what what the output gap is. But we know that last year we had both a supply shock and a demand shock. So, how much below potential we are right now is a big big unknown. But we do see on the data when you put. The different indicators on the dashboard it does suggest that, that we do have considerable slack in the labor market some of the indicators i showed i showed in the presentation in terms of um, our view on on the baseline view on why we think inflation pressures are likely to be muted the judgment essentially rests on three pillars uh, the first is that there's still uh, just repeating what i said a second ago there's still a lot of slack that, that needs to be worked off I mean, even in the united states we're something like eight eight and a half million jobs below the jobs uh, levels that we had in February 2020, at a time when the unemployment rate was, you know, 3.5 percent, or below, certainly below what most people thought was the Nairo, an allegedly super hot labor market at that time, but we did not see very rapid wage wage growth even back then. So, just getting back to those headline levels of unemployment, uh, and then once you consider the the latent slack through involuntary part-time employment, through diminished hours, when you put all of that together. I'd suggest that there's a very long exit ramp to go uh, before we can before we start seeing price pressures coming back in a significant way. The second is, you know, going into the crisis, uh, the second pillar here, this, going into the crisis, it was very well recognized that that uh, price prices, the sensitivity of prices to 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 changes in slack, the so-called slope, the Phillips curve, the slope of the Phillips curve, had diminished over time. Uh, because of you know, globalization, because of automation, um, uh, because of rising market power, various explanations were put forward. So far, at least, we, we don't see evidence to suggest that those forces are likely to reverse in a big way, in a rapid way, coming out of this crisis. And the third, and here's where the big uncertainty, and Karen, you, you brought this up, too. the third is uh, the behavior of inflation expectations. And so far, at least, we, we see inflation expectations are, are pretty well anchored. If you look at the five-year, five-year forwards, and you look at where inflation is expected to be you know, and over the medium term, it's still just you know, in, in, in around central bank targets. And for the US, it's still around 2%. Even, you know, I'm talking about the medium term, I'm not talking about the next two years where we know inflation expectations have, have gone up, if you just look at the tips versus the nominal yields uh, for the short, short yields. Um, the question is, you know what what's going to happen with this going forward especially coming out of this period when we've had we're gonna we're gonna see transitory pressures headline inflation is going to pick up in the next few months it's already picked up is that going to in the next three or four months lead to an unanchoring of inflation expectations is a big unknown but but our sense is that you know as long as the fed is communication is is spot on and and we don't see any reason to think that that will change um it's 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 very likely that inflation expectations will remain anchored coming out of it this is true elsewhere too as well. I think we're not so worried about Japan, about the Euro area where inflation is still well below target and inflation expectations are pretty well anchored. Um, so in general, you know, even in the global piece that Jay was talking about, our sense is that globally too, that this, what we're seeing in the US is likely to play out elsewhere as well. Um, so again, you know, this is based on what we know right now, the huge unknowns, uh, relationships could change coming out of this crisis um, and and what happens to inflation expectations over the next six months is going to be key great thanks very much um i think in the interest of giving the analytical chapters a good hearing i'm going to pivot to them now and we may have a little time left for a general discussion at the very end especially the way some of the chapters intersect so um what i'd like to do now is um Turn things over to Sonali Das, who is a senior economist in the World Economic Studies Division at the IMF um, in the research department, and to talk about chapter two of the WIO, the after effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then um, afterwards, Danny Leipsker will give um, discussion comments. So Sonali, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. Um, so I'll just uh, make my screen. Okay. So yes, thank you. Very happy to be here. So I'm part of the team that worked on chapter two that you can see here. Did a great team and contributions from a number of uh, people um, at the fund. So the focus of this chapter uh, was to shed light on the potential for uh, scarring um, after the COVID recession, um, which was something that we felt was worth revisiting given how unique this crisis was. And of course, there's a lot of uncertainty as has been discussed. Um, to do this, we looked at uh, previous recessions um, to draw what lessons we could about the channels through which scarring takes place, keeping in mind how different this uh, crisis has been. Um, and then also because one of the unique parts of this crisis was its unusual mix of demand and supply shocks in different sectors. Uh, we looked at historical instances of uh, um, sector specific shocks to see how they uh, propagate through to overall um, activity. Um, essentially, you see on the chart here that it was the high contact or contact intensive sectors that have been hit the hardest. And so we wanted to understand what that uh, implied um, for this question. Then we also uh, draw implications from the medium term from this and look at the current forecast, the expectations um, around what scarring will take place. And though there is a lot of uh, uncertainty here, at least we can explore um, what variation there is across countries in terms of uh, what's being expected. So just to set the stage, I'll briefly discuss um, the different potential channels of scarring. Uh, by scarring, we mean uh, the persistent damage, of course, to supply potential that can come from all the job losses and bankruptcies and so on uh, that happened during recessions. Um, so from the productivity side, of course, there's uh, the loss in firm specific know-how. Uh, typically during recessions, you have lower R&D investment and technology adoption and so on. That's one that's um, perhaps actually going in the other direction this uh, time with increased innovation and digitalization. Um, but one that may be more severe this time than past recessions is um, if you have, depending on how the policy response goes and the structures of economies, if you have large obstacles to resource reallocation, you may end up with large resource mismatches this time, um, given this unique sectoral um, kind of nature of this uh, crisis and that um, some of the high contact sectors may need to shrink permanently in certain places. Um, so that's one that could lead to uh, inefficiencies. Um, in terms of uh, the capital stock, you know, you have weak investment and that can happen during and after and, and remain after recessions. Um, in terms of the labor force um, from um, unemployment during the crisis, you can have discouraged uh, workers and labor force participation dropping and so on. Uh, another unique part of COVID is these large schooling interruptions um, that uh, Malhar discussed, um, and that could have very long term and serious effects on human capital accumulation. So getting into the analysis, um, first, this is the analysis of the past recessions. So we have a sample of about 600 recessions um, in over 100 countries, so a broad sample. And we use local projection methods to trace out the path of output per capita following the recessions. And we differentiate by the type of recession. So for example, those associated with past modern epidemics and pandemics past disasters and conflicts, those are not shown here, but in the analysis, and uh, also those with financial crisis and the remaining recessions we refer to as the typical recessions. So that's the blue line on the chart. Um, and basically the way this is done, they're cumulative uh, response functions. So if the lines went back to zero, that would uh, show that the output had fully recovered to the pre-recession level. And what you see is that there's permanent output losses for all the different types of recessions. Now, this is fairly well known from previous literature for the case of financial crises, at least, and actually even more broadly. Uh, but we revisited this first uh, before next turning to um, the broad channels through which the scarring occurs. So um, essentially here, we're decomposing those output losses you saw on the previous slide uh, into the supply side components. So total factor productivity, the capital to employment ratio, and employment per capita. And what you see is for the typical recession, the blue lines, the damage really comes from persistent losses in TFP and productivity. Now you have um, impacts on capital and employment as well, but they more or less recover after about five years, um, mostly. Um, now in the case of the financial crisis recessions, which are more severe, you have permanent permanent losses in all of the factors. 
Um, so that's not uh, surprising, especially in the case of capital that you have, you, you see after financial crises, credit, interme credit intermediation breaking down and investment uh, remaining very weak. So the next part of the analysis um, is, I'll just discuss a little bit before getting to this chart, is um, so we next studied sector specific shocks um, using a recent method built by Achimoglu and other uh, co-authors that employs inter-industry, inter-country input output tables um, to map the linkages between sectors within and across countries as well. And we looked at two types of sector specific shocks, a supply shock, so changes in the sector uh, specific productivity, and also a demand shock, so changes in the government spending in that sector. Um, and what we found, uh, uh, just put simply, there's some, some nuances, but um, that network effects or sectoral spillovers historically have tended to be quite meaningful, quite large, with network effects being larger than the effects on the sector that receives the shock itself. Um, so here in this slide, what we've done is a back of the envelope exercise using those historical coefficients and the shocks that occurred um, in 2020 uh, to understand how much the sectoral implication was um, important uh, for the COVID shock. Um, and why is this interesting is when you think about um, the sectors that were most affected, these high contact um, services sectors, um, you think you realize that, well, they're not particularly central to production networks. They're actually relatively peripheral, say, compared to, um, say, the energy sector. But despite that, we found that they, um, they meaningfully really amplified the shock, uh, not because they're so central to networks, but because of the sheer size of the shock that hit those high contact sectors uh, compared to the other sectors. So uh, finally, in terms of the analysis, we looked at the forecast revisions for um, country teams, um, uh, medium term forecasts. So basically this is comparing the current forecast for 2020, these bars to the pre-crisis forecasts, um, which was done in the January 2020 uh, wheel round. And what you see is that um, the red bars for COVID for global output, uh, scarring after COVID is expected to be quite a bit lower than um, in the global financial crisis, as Malhard also mentioned. So currently expecting around 3% uh, output losses uh, comparing to the pre-crisis expectations. And for the GFC, it was about eight and a half that was realized and also that was expected about a year after the, the global financial crisis. Now, one alarming um, aspect of this chart is, though much less scarring is expected for the advanced economies, for um, the emerging markets, it's still uh, substantial and for the low-income countries, it's actually larger. So this is this divergent um, recoveries that we are concerned about um, that Mahar discussed. Uh, so this underscores how important this inclusive vaccine access is. Um, and uh, on the next uh, slide, we looked at um, what are some of the correlates, uh, what explains the variation across countries. Um, so of course, there's a lot of uncertainty and though the overall amount of scarring is, is hard to assess uh, to some extent because of this uncertainty, it's clear that there be, will be a lot of variation across countries and it would depend on the path of the pandemic in a particular country uh, the sectoral structure of the country and the ability of the businesses and the workers to adapt um, is needed. Also the policy response and a number of other factors will affect the country specific scarring. Um, here we did a simple regression analysis to see um, kind of what story you can find in terms of the cross country variation. And we see that that uh, kind of bears out. So it's, um, a cross-country analysis, um, and it includes dummy variables for the country income groups and regions, and we tried a number of, of variables. And, and what you see is that it's really the sectoral structure and the above the line fiscal response um, that uh, drives the variation um, in expected scarring across countries. Uh, so just for example here, countries that have a one standard deviation, um, higher share of tourism um, in their economies are expected to have all else equal, at uh, two percent larger output losses. So, um, just to conclude, those are the bits of the analysis. From that, we we take away that um, productivity losses uh, following previous recessions have been um, a key driver, uh, have been important, um, and also 
uh, sectoral uh, productivity shocks uh, have had large and persistent effects and have propagated through production networks. Um, and in terms of um, the policy implications, it's clear how important uh, avoiding financial distress is. Um, so far owing to the large policy res uh, response that's largely been avoided. And you know, it's clear from the expectations compared to the global financial crisis, how, how important that is. Um, in terms of the sequencing and the tailoring of the policy response, Malhar has discussed those. Um, to just focus on the medium term, once uh, countries arrive at that, that point, um, when fiscal space permits, policymakers are gonna need kind of a combined package um, to get at uh, all the different channels and to, to prevent um, uh, losses in productive capacity. Um, so one of the keys will be to reverse setbacks to the human capital accumulation um, that have occurred through these schooling interruptions and also more broadly, and also to encourage employment. Um, so on the first, that'll include um, ensuring adequate resources for early childhood development and education and so on. Also in terms of productivity, um, allowing non-viable firms to exit uh, smoothly, that will be important, as well as uh, a number of policies to facilitate resource reallocation, uh, both of uh, you know, capital and stranded sectors, um, and also in the labor force that the next chapter uh, delves into more deeply. And also it'll be important to boost investment, uh, public investment, particularly green uh, infrastructure investment, um, and also repair uh, corporate private balance sheets uh, to, to get strong private investment going again. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Great, thanks very much. Um, let me turn it uh, straight over to Danny Leipziger, who is at George Washington University um, and also a fac faculty affiliate at IAP. Uh, thank you, Jay. Um, Okay. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to comment on this uh, report. Uh, I think it's very important, uh, very well done, and uh, we recommend WIOs to all our classes. And uh, there's a, a good reason why we uh, why we do that. Um, so I have a few slides, but I'm not going to uh, go over every uh, element. Uh, I think the report makes very good. Uh, uh, case for the multi-speed recovery. Uh, and I'm going to focus more on the emerging market economies uh, whose recoveries are a little bit um, uh, different than the advanced. Uh, I think an important uh, conclusion is that the uh, losses for the emerging market economies, uh, although in terms of output losses, they're going to perhaps be less than for the global financial crisis. Uh, that the scarring effects could be uh, uh, longer lasting. Uh, I think that's, um, uh, that's important. Um, so I think uh, Sonali has gone over the channels for this kind of scarring through the labor markets, uh, through the capital stock and what we can expect in terms of uh, drops in investment levels and interruptions in supply chains, et cetera. Uh, the fact that uh, this will affect productivity, uh, particularly in the service sector, and that it will affect some countries more than others is very clear. Um, I think an important finding is that uh, for emerging markets, we need to worry more about the long lasting effects, particularly in terms of their access to uh, credit. Uh, and the fact that financial crises, if you look at those um, compared recessions, uh, the damage is uh, the largest when you have financial crises. And I think the possibility of countries having financial crises uh, in the next couple of years uh, has really gone up. Uh, the spillover effects that Sonali mentioned uh, from the service sector uh, slowdown uh, is also an important uh, channel. Um, so I'm going to focus mostly, as I said, on the emerging markets because they have the least uh, resiliency in terms of their uh, income, their ability to generate uh, a new tax revenue and their vulnerability. Uh, they're highly dependent. Um, we used to just worry about, you know, commodity dependence, but now we're looking at tourism dependence, uh, remittances and other things that are um, going to affect their, uh, their outlook. 
on top of this, we have what we could call pre-existing conditions. We have very high debt levels in most of the emerging market economies. Uh, and this is uh, just uh, gotten worse through the pandemic and has reinforced uh, certain uh, trends that we saw before in terms of uh, changes in global value chains, uh, difficulties in creating jobs uh, and other uh, problems. So the big takeaway, I think, is the is the last one, which is that uh, if the pandemic and the aftershock leads to financial crises, the costs uh, for emerging markets will rise uh, dramatically. Um, so, uh, you know, the IMF uh, report also has some uh, standard uh, recommendations in it. Uh, I think we need to take uh, a, a look at the uh, environment in which these are given because for many emerging markets, uh, their fiscal positions have weakened uh, dramatically. Uh, we, we know that for advanced economies, we're talking about fiscal packages of 15% of GDP, low income maybe uh, three to 5% and lower middle uh, perhaps in the 10% range. The ability of these countries to uh, raise taxes, uh, I think that's sort of a non-starter. Um, so it's always a good thing to talk about uh, increasing the tax base and et cetera, et cetera, but uh, hard to do. Uh, many of these countries have borrowed in external markets to fill their financing and fiscal gaps, which means they, they, will, they will have these um, uh, future debt problems to worry about. Uh, the admonition about targeting social spending uh, was fine, hard, hard to implement. Um, the idea to worry about the efficiency of public spending, I think, is one of the key uh, factors. I think uh, we could go through a lot of examples for emerging markets about how uh, public investment projects uh, are, are inefficient, um, how uh, social spending doesn't have the desired results. So uh, it's very difficult for uh, countries to find this fiscal space. Uh, and I would personally say you should look more on the expenditure side than on the uh, tax side uh, for those uh, types of uh, um, uh, gains. I think there's gonna be a lot of pressure on the IMFs, uh, on, on you uh, and your colleagues, uh, Mahar, to uh, provide unconditional support. Um, and uh, uh, we can look at how that has worked. I was going to give you an example on Brazil, but I think it's uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip it just to say that they're going to have a lot of domestic debt and fiscal problems uh, going forward as a result of, uh, uh, of, of the crisis. Um, so I think we're looking at new initiatives that could help ease the pain. Um, I think the SDR uh, allocation that may well uh, be forthcoming uh, could be helpful. Of course, only 40% perhaps goes to emerging markets and within that group, uh, a much smaller percentage to the low income uh, countries. Uh, what I would like to see in addition to the excellent report that was produced uh, is a greater emphasis on uh, debt sustainability. I think using uh, what Karen was talking about, which is the uncertainty. Um, and uh, if you look at the latest uh, book that came out by John Kay and Mervyn King on radical uncertainty, uh, you know, the, the models may not be uh, perfect, uh, certainly not in very uncertain times, but I think uh, I would focus a lot of attention on the debt sustainability uh, issue uh, because I think that we need to see some preemptive uh, debt reprofiling um, with participation by all creditors uh, in order to uh, limit the damage, right? I mean, we're, we're told that in this report, the initial uh, shock on emerging markets is less than uh, we would have thought. Uh, but I think the risk of a longer term uh, damage, either from scarring or, and, or from uh, debt uh, distress uh, is something that we can't uh, ignore. Um, so I, Sonali, I, I think your chapter is a good one. Uh, it's got some, some really uh, interesting um, information in it. Um, I think the takeaway is that the biggest risk is financial crises. Uh, so I think uh, 
we should take that away. I think um, we should worry a bit about uh, modeling in general for events that are, you know, once in a hundred years events, we, we hope. Um, so we have to take that with a grain of uh, salt. I think you make a very good uh, point that uh, not only have countries been differentially affected, but also uh, households uh, within countries. So the income inequality uh, issue uh, is uh, more relevant than it was before. Uh, I think the point that productivity is gonna take a big hit, we have to look at those building blocks of uh, productivity. Um, I think there's good news in the overall report that the advanced economies may recover more quickly uh, than we might've thought. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there are these big ifs. Um, and I come back to the biggest risk, uh, which is the emerging markets uh, suffering a further shock to what they've already suffered uh, through financial markets. And uh, I think that's where a lot of the uh, additional uh, analysis uh, should be headed. So with that, thank you very much for allowing me to comment on this very good chapter. Thanks very much, Danny. Um, I'd, I'd like to turn it back over to Sonali for uh, just a second for a few responses and maybe in particular, you know, point you to that comment uh, Danny raised a few times about a concern that um, we could model what's happened so far, but if this turns into financial crises in many of these countries, then, then we'd be looking at something more severe. And actually, I wanted to pick up on one last point he made, which is kind of the uncertainty around modeling a, what we hope is a one in a hundred year event. And, be, and because I wanted to ask you in the chapter, you use prior health pandemic related recessions and just asking to what extent you and your team felt like they were really comparable in, in global nature or severity or length. Uh, thank you, thank you both. Um, so I'll start with that last question in terms of, uh, you know, how we broke out the modern epidemics and pandemics. When you see their effects, they kind of come out between the financial crises and like the typical recession. So we thought that was interesting. Um, but there is an issue with comparability. We would think this one would be more severe um, in that it's you know much more synchronized and global and more severe it's an impact. A, a lot of those, it's just a few countries, you know, so it's not uh, that comparable. If you want to go back to one that's comparable, you know, you have the Spanish flu and people have studied that Barrow and others. Um, and that's not comparable for different reasons. World War I had started and you know the, the makeup of economies and so on. So um, it was interesting to analyze, but um, that's why I didn't emphasize it so much in the presentation. Um, turning to um, the, the points um, you raised, Danny, all, all points very well taken in the analysis, um, the financial crises, it's uh, banking crises and debt crises and currency crises, of course. So, um, we could explore a little bit the differences between those, and I'm sure it's been done, but overall that's, that's of course, a key concern. And um, when you look at the forecast differences that we present in the chapter, that's currently the, the assumption under there is, of course, that there's a sustained recovery from the crisis where uh, financial stability risks remain contained. Um, so, you know, that is, that is a key issue. Um, the, the points you raised on the difficult um, fiscal situations, of course, it's challenging and that's why you, you know we mentioned a few things but really you need that international cooperation um, really on two fronts one is in those situations of global liquidity I mean um, which Malhar mentioned in his discussion but also if you can um, just make the whole situation less severe by really having that cooperation on the vaccines uh, to limit this problem as much as possible um, that will also be important um, to the extent that um, not in our own analysis, but uh, there's been some other uh, work at the fund on ways to kind of maximize the fiscal space you have in terms of better targeting um, the, the workers and the firms um, that are um, uh, most affected. Um, but overall, yes, it's, it's a challenging situation and, and some new initiatives may be needed. Um, um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. It's uh, obviously a really important question is how, how long the shadow of, of this last year or what's still taking place is, is going to be. Um, I wanna turn it over now to the, to the last chapter of the, um, 
of the WIO, the chapter three, recessions and recoveries in labor markets, um, and thinking about different patterns that can take place there. The presenter is Francesca Caselli, who's an economist in the World Economic Studies Division of the IMF. And then we'll have uh, discussion comments from Kristen Brody, who is at the Hamilton Project. Thank you. Let me share. My screen. Can you see well? Yes, we can. Okay. So thank you very much. So I'm going to present chapter three uh, that takes a closer look at recession and recoveries in labor markets, focusing particularly on patterns, policies, and responses to the COVID-19 shock. This is, of course, a joint uh, work with a big team. Uh, with John Bluder, Wenji Chen, Nils Jakob Hansen, Jorge Mondragon, Ipe Shibat, and Marina Tavares. And we also received great research support from uh, Yu Wang, Chris Jones, and Cynthia Nyaket. So let me start by providing some very broad stylized facts on labor market dynamics in both advanced and emerging economies. So as we all know, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic shock has been causing large economic disruptions and worker dislocations around the world. As we can see here in the slide, unemployment rates are up compared to the average in 2018 and 19 in both advanced economies and emerging markets. When focusing instead on labor force participation, we observe that the average advanced economy has not seen a marked change in this labor market margin, while the average emerging market has seen a sharp drop. So the next step that we take in the chapter is to unpack these effects across demographic and socioeconomic groups. And we can immediately see, uh, as was already mentioned in, in previous presentation as well, that the shock, the COVID shock has been highly unequal across uh, groups of workers. In particular, the low skill that in our classification are those with secondary education and below and youth have been hit harder in the average advanced and emerging market economies with larger rises in unemployment rates and also declines in uh, labor force participation. In emerging markets, we also observe that women have seen a greater rise in unemployment on average, while there are some signs with the latest data that men in advanced economies have been harder hit than women on average. So we now turn in the chapter to the sectoral dimension of the crisis, that which we know is also uh, very important. And reflecting sort of the large, the larger direct impact of the pandemic on more contact intensive sectors, the COVID shock, as we all know, has been highly asymmetric in its employment effect, in its employment effects. So here in the left hand side chart, uh, we show that the sharpest drops in employment were uh, observable in wholesale and retail, transportation, accommodation and food services, as well as in arts and in the entertainment sectors. And this is in sharp contrast with what we observed during previous recessions, where manufacturing and construction were typically hardest hit, and this can be seen in the right hand side chart. However, uh, it's also important to note that some broad sectoral patterns of the COVID-19 shock are similar to those observed in past recession. And in particular, um, I mean that the sectors harder hit by the pandemic are also the ones more vulnerable to automation. So in the next slide, we provide some evidence about this. And uh, in fact, we show that workers that are working in sector more vulnerable to automation are generally harder hit by recessions, not only the COVID-19, but also typical recession. First, in the left-hand side chart, we show that over time, employment has been shifting away from sectors that are more vulnerable to automation, and that the share of employment workers with lower skill has fallen. This shift, reflects in part a direct movement of workers from more vulnerable to less vulnerable sectors. However, more often it comes from net hiring of workers from unemployment and non-participation, as shown in the middle chart. Exactly because this reallocation tends to work through joblessness, its so social cost can be very high. And this is especially true during the session when sectors that are more vulnerable to automation see large outflows into unemployment, as we present in the right hand side chart. In sum, what we have been showing so far is that the COVID-19 pandemic shock has been highly asymmetric in its employment impact across sectors and also demographic groups. And in the chapter, we'll look carefully at this second aspect by exploring individual level data on labor market transitions. 
So here uh, we start in the left-hand side chart assessing the aggregate probabilities of job finding, separation, and sectoral switches at the individual level. So we use the survey data and we aggregate up, and we find that we want to test to see whether uh, these uh, probabilities differ systematically during different phases of the business cycle. This is clearly important to compare the dynamics of past typical recessions with the current crisis. We observe that job findings at the individual level are lower in recessions and recoveries with respect to expansions, whereas separation appear to be always higher with respect to expansions. Sectoral switches are also procyclical as found typically in the literature. In the middle chart, we then aim to assess the inequalities that exist between demographic and socioeconomic groups, particularly age, gender, and skill for these outcomes. Unpacking the transition likelihood that we observed before reveals indeed a certain degree of heterogeneity across individual level characteristics, and also that the impact of recessions is particularly adverse for specific demographic groups. We observe, for instance, that consistent with the literature, on average, finding a job is easier for the young, but more difficult for women and those that are low skilled. For separations, there are no striking differences across categories. And for sectoral switches, we observe that the young are again the most advantaged category. If we focus on past recessions, looking at the right hand side chart, we observe that the young are particularly disadvantaged in finding a job, while women tend to be less likely to be laid off. Uh, the low skill tend instead to have both a higher likelihood of finding a job and also of losing it. However, in this, in this part, the separation effect likely dominates, leading the lower skill to be more prone to end up unemployed in a recession with respect to the higher skill. So overall, this finding suggests that past recessions showed some similar feature to the current crisis with youth and the lower skill particularly disadvantaged in the labor market. The earlier sign that women in advanced economies were also hurt more on average by the COVID-19 shock in our global samples different from what happened to, uh, with respect to previous recessions, appear to be fading. So labor market adjustments, however, may also reflect uh, worker changing not only job, but also occupation. And this aspect is particularly important during the COVID-19 pandemic, given the premium paid on occupations that can be performed remotely. However, these occupational switches uh, by workers and the earning changes associated with this switch do not typically occur in a vacuum, but instead, they often depend on the worker's employment history. So in the left-hand side chart, we show that occupational switches are much more likely to happen for an unemployment, unemployment person that gets re-employed than for a person that switches jobs remain employed via on-the-job uh, switches. And this suggests that workers appear to prefer remaining in the current occupation unless circumstances such as a prolonged spell of unemployment force them to switch. The right hand side uh, chart suggests a potential reason for this tendency to avoid occupational switches. And in fact, we see that while on the job reallocation is associated with a modest earning gain at around 2%, occupational reallocation via an unemployment spell is associated with the large earning drop of about 15%. In the chapter, we show that these findings on occupational switches and their associated earnings changes uh, across demographic groups do not systematically differ across different phases of the business cycles. However, there is a particular aspect that we want to flag, and it's the fact that among lower skilled workers who are able to find employment, the likelihood of switching op occupations via unemployment increases during a recession. And this is particularly concerning in light of the current conjuncture given that it suggests that lower skilled are likely being hit with a triple whammy. First, they are more likely to be employed in sectors disproportionately hit by the pandemic. Second, they are more likely to become unemployed during downturns. And third, those who find a new job are also more likely to have had to switch occupation and hence suffer an associated earning penalty, pointing to the uh, high social cost of these occupational switches. So, so far we have established that recession typically prompt reallocation and this, this reallocation is socially costly. The question is now what policy can do to reduce these costs in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And to answer this question in the chapter, we, knew, we use a new search and matching model 
that has different occupations with different degree of contact intensity. Consequently, the exposure of occupation to a pandemic shocks can vary. In this model, we simulate uh, the shock as an adverse lockdown shock causing social distancing to rise. This hurts the contact intensive occupation disproportionately and the shock is modeled as being largely transitory, but part of the impact on the occupational employment is permanent. So here in the chart, the, the chart, the blue line shows the effect on unemployment in a scenario without policy, and the red line shows the scenario with the package uh, that I'm going to describe now. So we, we analyze how the shock can be mitigated by the implementation of a combination of retention and reallocation policies. So in the model, retention policies are government transfers, for instance, to support the payment of firms wage bills when workers' matches are no longer profitable. Instead, reallocation policies are government subsidies to firms that reduce the cost of posting jobs. So the red line uh, represents a policy package favoring job retention policies under the lockdown and reallocation policies once the lockdowns are lifted. We can see that the package is effective first in lowering the rise in unemployment in the near term, but also in achieving a faster return to the new steady state. So in closing, uh, let me mention the policy implication of the chapter. First, given these results that I just showed you uh, on based on the model simulation, if countries have fiscal space, they should maintain support for job retention to avoid socially costly dislocation and dampen the effect on disadvantaged workers. Second, as the recovery gets underway, pivoting to worker reallocation policies can hasten labor market adjustments, which are costly. Third, the pivot from retention to reallocation policies could be linked to the duration and intensity of the pandemic. In practice, however, the timing of the phase out is complicated uh, by the high uncertainty and hence careful monitoring of the pandemic, including the rollout of a vaccine is essential. Finally, both retention and reallocation policies could be designed to target the most affected worker groups, for instance, via targeted wage services or startup incentives. And with this, I conclude. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. That was that was really interesting. I'd like to turn it over uh, right straight away to Kristen Brody from the Hamilton Project at Brookings uh, for comments. Good afternoon and thank you. I really enjoyed reading this report um, and it, it kind of lined up with my research which focuses on jobs at risk of being automation, at lost due to automation. Um, so that's jobs with very high automation risk scores, according to Brian Osborne, that those people were already at risk of losing those jobs. And then I also looked at jobs at low risk of being automated um, by race and, and thinking about how the COVID-19 pandemic affected people in those jobs. And so I like the discussion of, of the triple whammy of people being affected. So these people are more likely employed um, in jobs that were gonna be hit by the pandemic because they're jobs that have to be done face-to-face. -face. They cannot be done remotely. Um, they're, they're also jobs that are more likely at risk of being automated. So when I think about in the United States, there are 3.16 million cashiers that job has an automation risk score of above 0.9. And so basically what the automation risk score does, it, it's between zero and a hundred. And so if the job is like 0.94, that means that a machine or some type of program can do 94% of the tasks that happen in that eight hour job. Um, so, so another one is retail salespersons. There are 3.1 million um, retail salespeople in the United States. And so I, I enjoyed all of the breakdowns in the report. I think the thing that maybe I want it to see, but, but maybe too difficult when you're looking at various countries is a racial breakdown to see who are these people, right? So we know men versus women, that women were more likely to be faced with childcare um, situations that even if they are at home, that the children are also at home. And so they may be trying to do a remote job while the children are, are trying to be in, in school. And so it makes me think about broadband access. 
and, and what is broadband like across these various countries? And even if you do have broadband, do you have more than one um, computer or laptops at home so that mom and or dad can be working while the children are in school? So for those reasons, I think we see these lower labor force participation rates for women, particularly women who are of childbearing age and who have children at home compared to men. Um, and so I guess when I, when I think about the racial breakdown, I'd be curious to see what, it, what it's like in other countries. But um, between January 2020 and March 2021, the um, unemployment rate for Black women was 2.37 percentage points higher than the overall rate on average. And for Hispanic women, it was 2.69 percentage points higher. So I understand the racial breakdown of, of the US better than any other country, but I guess when you think about majority and minority populations in various countries, I think it'd be interested, interesting to see what is that racial breakdown, if any. Because as you start to think about policies of preparing people for jobs that are going to exist, um, notwithstanding automation and jobs that are going to exist after the pandemic, who specifically are we trying to get into these jobs? Do these people need childcare? Do they need additional education? Do they need training? Do they need to move to a different area where a job is going to exist? Do they need public transportation? Is it bus fare? Is it, you know, what is it that these particular people need? And I think those needs are different based on if we're talking about young or older, men or women, um, and, and then of course by race as well. Um, so, so those are some of the things that, that I thought about. And, and I guess one of the policy implications that I've thought a lot about, again, particularly in the US and I think some other countries do better with this, Denmark for instance, Singapore, they have um, various programs, but looking at having universities and colleges that serve underserved populations. So in the United States, that would be Black and Hispanic populations that would be different in other countries, but having them partner with um, employers that are gonna be hiring people with government funding because universities are trying to prepare students for jobs based on whatever they think, right? But many professors don't have real world experience. So it's like, how are you trying to prepare someone for a job that you may not have worked in that industry ever or in many years? Employers are thinking, you know, this person came out with a bachelor's, master's or PhD, so they would be prepared, but they're not for specific um, on the job uh, tasks, right? Especially considering automation, especially considering whatever the world is going to be like after the pandemic. And then as far as partnerships, which side is gonna fund it, right? So the universities that serve minority populations already need more money and corporations don't wanna invest more in training because they're afraid if I invest all of this money in this person and then they leave, I've locked this investment. So if there was additional government funding to help build these partnerships, then schools could talk to, to employers to know this is what students need to know and be able to do in order to do these jobs. Employers will get people who are trained and government funding would go to a good source. And so again, I think particularly Denmark and Singapore have done very well with that. Um, and those models could be applied to other places, not just for students coming out of school, but for workers who have been um, displaced by automation or the pandemic to be able to go to their local university to get the training and follow that same pipeline. So I feel like I could talk about this for absolutely ever, um, but I won't. But those those are those are my thoughts looking at the the really really awesome report that you wrote, Francesco. Thanks so much, uh, Kristen, for those comments. Um, let me uh, hand it back to Francesca for a moment to um, to respond to those points and maybe to put two of them into questions. Just thinking about. But you phrased it really nicely. One point specifically: Who are we trying to reallocate, right? And and in different countries, that may vary by it could be by race, could be by immigration status. You know, who are the vulnerable populations here? Um, but then also the closing point of um, as we're thinking about these reallocation policies, how how does the education sector and especially the university or 
um, type sector play a role. Thank you, thank you, Jay and Kristen for the for the discussion. So uh, let me uh, maybe try to answer like this question: Who is who is vulnerable? And maybe give you a bit of um, more details on on the data we use and on the sample we we um, have had access for for the charter. So uh, we were very lucky to have access to this sur micro data survey from the U EU Labor uh, Force Survey and also the the US CPS. So our sample was. Uh, mostly advanced economies for the for the analysis of individual labor market characteristics. So there we decided to, um, I mean, we had information on gender, age, skill. We had a couple of more information, marital status, number of kids, uh, whether uh, the individual is living in a rural or urban area. However, the coverage was a bit patchy. So we decided to kind of focus on these three main uh, dimension, age, uh, skill, and gender. And uh, it's really interesting even to, I mean, on the, on the gender's perspective, there's been you know, a lot of, of talk, especially in the US about the, the she session. And, and we have seen like uh, several studies documenting that in the, in the first of months of the pandemic, the you know, uh, pr uh, employment outcome of women have been much, uh, much worse than those of men. And so we, we, we dig that a bit deeper in this, in our sort of global sample. And if we, uh, when we look at employment outcome, we see a very heterogeneous picture, for instance, in, uh, in the difference of employment between men and women. And um, especially if the pandemic progressed towards Q3, uh, in Q2, actually there were two to half of the countries to two thirds of the countries that were in a she session, what we call a she session in the, in the paper. But by Q3, most of the countries were out of a she session. And we found this pretty interesting. Of course, employment is one labor market outcome. So it's a very broad and macro sort of uh, indicator. We also looked at other dimensions such as hours worked. And there, in fact, we see that men were hit harder on average in both uh, advanced and emerging economies. Um, whereas labor force participation uh, shows worse outcome for women. And so there maybe this can speak a bit more uh, to the question also about like uh, mothers and uh, working mothers who have to carry a disproportionate uh, burden in childcare. So we didn't have information on this, but um, for instance, in another paper that my co-author Marina uh, prepared on the US, clearly uh, it speaks exactly to this point that working mother have seen the worst, uh, worst outcome in, in labor markets. So they are dead information on the number of kids and therefore they could do a more um, detailed analysis. It's also interesting to think about you know, uh, longer term effects. And in fact, the fact that women might even rethink their career decision in light of the pandemic. So this is something we cannot observe in, an, in employment data, but it's something that we have re read uh, in, uh, in surveys. Uh, so I think it's still very much unfolding and there are many different aspects that often uh, we cannot cover in the wheel because of our global sample, but uh, um, are definitely an important aspect to, to consider. Thanks very much. So I noticed we, we have uh, just about five minutes left. And um, in, this is in theory supposed to be general Q&A and concluding remarks. And so I'm wondering if actually I could pose one question to all six uh, speakers here. And it comes out of the fact that if you saw news coverage of, of this WIO, um, I think a lot of it centered on one slide that uh, Mahar presented, which showed an upgrade in the global growth forecasts. Um, and so I think in many ways, the news coverage of it was a very optimistic wheel. And I think if we listen to the last, um, you know, last hour and a half, there, there are a lot of concerns out there, you know, whether it's issues around risks talked about in the first chapter, potential long-term damage in the second, or, you know, the potential ways that the pandemic could have accelerated pre-existing issues around inequality and, and vulnerable workers. And so I guess what I'd be curious about, maybe we could go in order of, of who spoke, is just really a you know, 30, 30 second or one minute answer of, is there, is there something you're really concerned about when you think about not just this wheel, but in general around what we're coming out of the pandemic into that you and in particular, maybe what you're focused on to monitor that is, is there an indicator you're really watching that, that has you concerned? And so 
um, with, with apologies for that incredibly broad question. Um, let me start with uh, Mahar. Um, well, 30 seconds on this. I, I think the key for me really is the labor market. I mean, it's, it's uh, we, yes, we do have a rebound and headline growth rates, but 6% global growth after a year in which we had negative 3.3 is not something that, you know, we should be applauding. I mean, it's part of it is a mechanical snapback. It's a good thing we're growing this year that we haven't seen a second year of, of subdued growth or, or, you know, even worse contraction, but but even so, we need to we need to pair those two numbers together, the six percent this year with the negative three three point three last year. Um, so I, my 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 key indicator really is uh, on what's happening in the labor market. I mean, the U.S. the numbers are well known. We you know as I mentioned in my comments, eight eight and a half million people still fewer employed today than in February twenty twenty. But if you look across the emerging market space as well, I mean, countries out you know for which we have the data, for example, Chile is another place where we have headline employment rates well below what we had prior to the pandemic. Um, so the key really, and I think this is where chapter three presents a set of recommendations on how we can hasten the employment recovery. Um, acknowledging the huge uncertainty, I think Karen put it very nicely about, you know, it's, it's hard to know when we should be pivoting from retention to reallocation, what, and as Krista mentioned, what type of the uncertainty about what type of sectors uh, would be the ones that we need to facilitate the reallocation towards. All of these are big unknowns, uh, but but even so, I think taking to taking that even with that uncertainty, I think the, the focus really should be on labor market healing and and getting people back into employment. Great, thank you, uh, Karen. Um, so uh, Mahar Mahar took my the answer I was going to say, which was labor markets. Um, I feel a little, a little like I did when you asked me to discuss this report, which is so complete and so thoughtful. And what more could I add? Um, so I won't go there. I guess I, since since nobody else will probably talk about overheating, I'll talk about overheating. Um, it's not my my uh, baseline uh, forecast. Um, I think it's not something that's going to be very likely to happen. Um, but as the IMF report points out, if it does happen and central banks do have moves sooner than markets expect them to, there could be some pretty bad uh, fallout. Um, so so there, um, I just do feel like we're flying a little blind because I think a lot of this analysis of whether how demand compares with supply is looking backwards at 2020. And I just don't think this is a time when you can look backwards when things are changing so rapidly right now. Um, but is it, so, so I'm not convinced that um, aggregate demand is going to continue to fall short of aggregate supply if supply is not able to open up fast enough to meet all of this demand that's coming out. But really at the end of the day, whether that's a pro, that's gonna be a temporary situation. It's something that we're talking about that's like six months versus or a year. Really at the end of the day for this to become sustained, you gotta watch, uh, it's about inflation expectations. So that's my indicator, which is watching inflation expectations. Great, uh, Sonali. Thank you. So I was also probably gonna first go with labor market, but I won't uh, go there either. Just uh, in the sense that that's really for the other chapter gets into it in a very detailed way, but coming out of the analysis of our chapter, it's debatable, but my uh, impression is there'll be a lot of permanent uh, shrinkage of some of these sectors. And so, um, you know, permanent preference shifts and so on. And so, you know, where will that labor ultimately go if it's lower skilled to begin with? Um, you know, it's, it seems very challenging, but sorry, I shouldn't give two answers. I would just say then kind of from the focus of our chapter, um, the schooling interruptions, of course, we, you know, Mahar mentioned, and we mentioned it's a big concern, um, not just because of the effects on like the human capital of the people who um, ultimately, you know, return to smooth schooling. I mean, that's, that's going to be very large, but it's something, you know, that we haven't uh, explored, but it seems very possible is that some people, uh, especially in, you know, some of the developing economies, so on, just, it's interrupted and they don't go back. So, you know, that's, that's very concerning. And so um, I think, there's many concerning things uh, following COVID, but that's one I would uh, mention. Thank you. Uh, Danny. Yeah, so I think you're right. The headline is uh, things are not as bad as uh, we thought they were, or they're gonna recover. But I think the preoccupation is that it's a very divergent recovery, both uh, among countries, 
uh, and inside countries. And I think that's, uh, that, that's the worry, which is that uh, there were pre-existing conditions and there are a lot of things as chapter three has shown uh, that can make them worse. So what should you look at? I mean, I think, you know, income inequality clearly, uh, I think the measures of unemployment that we look at certainly in the advanced economies are misleading. And I think in developing countries, uh, not very useful. Uh, so there are other indicators that one needs to, uh, I think, focus on to measure how uh, certain, as certain segments of society, certain people uh, are, are suffering more and how uh, inequality is, is, I think, un unfortunately going to get worse. Um, thank you. Uh, Francesca. I'm, I'm running out of, of ideas. <laughs> I, I'm just like, um, I thought what Karen said about inflation expectations and uh, the old debate about overeating is, is very interesting. And uh, it's very much uh, so far US kind of based. And so I'm, I'm, I'm curious to kind of monitor how this evolves also in uh, in emerging markets and now anchoring of inflation expectations in emerging markets, which recently achieved deflation. I mean, in the last uh, you know decades, they managed to bring inflation down and to achieve a better level of anchoring in inflation expectation comparable to those of advanced economies, how they will sort of react to maybe also a normalization of uh, monetary policy in, in the US. Thank you. And uh, to wrap things up, Kristen. So I think that there are a lot of policies, um, be it a universal basic income or unemployment insurance, childcare, et cetera. There are, are requirements and, and ways that people have to sign up to get these benefits. And so I think that as, as people get benefits and the economies come back, I think that we need to focus on people who have not been helped, people who may be discouraged workers, um, that didn't get UI, didn't get rental assistance because their name is not on the lease. They don't have a mortgage. So I think that that for people who could work remotely, they actually saved money. They weren't getting their hair done. They weren't going to dry cleaners. They weren't eating out. So you've got these remote workers that have saved all of this money and are doing well and are ready to buy houses and have fixed up their current houses. But I think that we really need to focus on the people who don't have a job and have not been helped by policies that currently exist because they don't know, don't have access, or didn't meet the requirements. Those are the people who are going to need help the most. Great. Thank you. Um, I, th I think that's a, a great list of things that people should be thinking about and focused on. Um, I want to thank the IMF team again for partnering with us here. Uh, those were terrific presentations. And really thank the discussants for um, stepping in and and finding some really insightful things to say about these chapters. Um, and so thanks to everyone for joining us. And I think we're going to sign off now. So thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon, evening, or morning, wherever you are.